Hello and welcome to today's webinar about how social landlords are creating a golden thread of information for their properties. Today's event sponsored by Plan Radar will explore how landlords could and should be navigating the requirements of the new building safety bill and the expectations of the new building safety regulator. And it's a session that has a practical focus. So we'll be talk talking to landlords about their own approach, as well as gaining insight into the workings of the Building Regulations Advisory Committee's Golden Thread Working Group. Uh, that's a, you need a couple of breaths to get through that one. Uh, there's lots to get through, so I'll keep an introduction at the introduction brief. But before we start, a brief bit of background to set the scene. Obviously, we're talking about an area of fundamental importance um, to social landlords and also an area which will recall, recall, uh, require sorry, many to work in a very different way. In the bill, the government has defined three separate gateway points, points at which the building owner must demonstrate compliance during the design and build of a high rise. That golden thread of information will then be handed over to the building owner on completion and developed during occupation by the uh, relevant duty holders and accountable persons. So that's that's the kind of very, very um, brief, uh, brief history. And today we'll be looking to find out how landlords are looking to navigate those requirements and expectations. And we'll also be looking at both at the benefits of taking action, but also to look to unpick any challenges that landlords have been facing and might, may face along the way. So looking to kind of understand um, uh, how, how people um, tuning in today uh, might look to identify and overcome some of those issues. And we'll be looking at the types of technology that might support accountability in the life of a building. Um, so we'll, we'll be taking a, a bit of an overview about where, where things might be headed and, and um, what's already out there. So we've got an incredible panel of speakers lined up today um, to help us achieve those goals. We'll be hearing from Aman Sharma, Deputy Chair of the Building Regulations Advisory Committee Golden Thread Working Group, Jack Ostrovsky, Head of Sustainable, uh, Sustainability and Design with Southern Housing Group and Chair of the BIM for Housing Associations Group, Vicky Saunders, Managing Director of BTP Architects, Robert Norton, UK Senior Account Manager, Fire, Health and Safety with Plan Radar, and Richard Whitaker, Director of Development at Citizen Housing. So yeah, that's 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 who we've got here today, uh, lined up lined up for you and um, ready ready to, ready to speak. Um, and we've got a, a, you know absolutely um, a fantastic event um, and, and lots and lots to get through. Um, before we move on to, to to the first presentations, though, let's get a bit of a feel for where where you are in the in, in the room today, um, and uh, just to give us a little bit of a, a a feel for for where we're pitching things. So, um, yeah, there's a poll up on the screen now. To what extent is your organisation using technology to fulfil the requirements of the Building Safety Bill? So let's see where you, where you're all at. Um, so we got a all our compliance data is digitally recorded and saved in the cloud. Um, B, we use up to five systems to record data, and then we're planning to move to a digital system within the next year, or we haven't thought about it yet. So uh, a bit of a mix, but whichever one's the most most kind of relevant to to you, um, let's let's see where where you all are. So we'll just give a, a couple more seconds just for for everybody to to click, and then we'll move to the poll results. So if we can move to the poll results now, um, and just get a bit of a feel for where where people are today who are tuning in, um, and there's a, a an awful lot of you, I think. So yeah, if we can just move to those results, yeah, and a bit, a bit of a spread, um, a spread there. So more than fifty percent um, uh, using up to five systems to record uh, data. Um, uh, uh, another fifteen or so percent <laughs> digital record saved in the cloud. But then uh, we've got uh, twenty-five percent looking to move to a digital system within the next year and uh, a small percentage, uh, 3% um, who haven't thought about it yet. So, okay, a little bit of a spread, but um, a, a kind of relatively clear picture of, of our audience emerging. So thank, thank you for that. And just a reminder to everybody tuning in, actually, this is your opportunity to ask the questions that are going to be useful to you, um, going, to, going to be kind of important takeaways um, for, for you in your, your own organizations. So do please use the um, Q&A box, um, ask away, and I will pick up on as many as your questions as possible following um, the presentation. So do do get uh, do get asking away as we go through, and, and we'll get through as many many as possible. Right, that is more than enough for me, and we will crack on with the presentations. Uh, and I will now hand over to Aman. So Aman, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin, and uh, good morning to everyone who's joined us today. Um, 
it's my absolute pleasure to join you and the first thing I should and will do is just give a thanks to everyone at Inside Housing and to yourself Martin and the team for inviting me to um, come speak with you about this all important topic of the golden thread. I think the audience um, generally will recognise that this is a topic that has been pulled out from the wider building safety agenda as integral to the delivery of the new safety case regime for higher risk buildings. And I think we've seen that in a number of webinars, events and exhibitions over the last few years. And certainly since Dame Judith made the recommendations in both her interim and final report. And it feels like quite a relevant day to be having this discussion with the news that the bill is now at Royal Assent stage within the House of Lords, having now safely and successfully navigated its parliamentary process and is due to imminently become an act. Uh, a very seminal moment indeed for all those observing and watching with very close interest. Before we explore the topic um, in um, some detail, both within myself and the, the um, experts that have joined us, I think it is also equally pertinent to mark the fact that we are some five to six weeks away from officially marking the fifth anniversary of the tragic event that's brought us to this point and indeed to this occasion. We really mustn't forget that it was the death of 72 innocent lives that brought us about this agenda of building safety reform. And I'm a big believer that everything we do is in the name of those 72 innocent lives that were lost and to prevent any future tragedies on that scale ever happening again. So we're here to discuss this issue of golden thread, the new requirements and the actions that social landlords in particular are taking to implement this reform ahead of the developing legislation, which is an absolutely fantastic thing to be seeing. And there are uh, certainly a plethora of evidence out there of organisations, housing associations in particular, from my experience, that are cracking on with this requirement and doing it very, very successfully. But I want to set out a little bit of overview of the story so far, if I may, which I hope serves as a bit of a reminder for the journey we've taken with Golden Thread so far. As Martin pointed out, um, I have the um, absolute privilege of being the deputy chair of both the Golden Thread Working Group, um, but also the main Building Regulations Advisory Committee as well. And it was Brack um, in conversation with Dame Judith and the ISSG that first raised the issue of establishing a centre point for the development of the policy so that industry could collectively contribute to the definition of the golden thread itself, but also the publication of the policy and working through the various iterations. That was fully established within the back end of 2020. And that working group has been working tirelessly, I can assure you, to produce some of the outputs that I'm sure our audience are very familiar with. The first of which, of course, was the BRAC Golden Thread Report published in July 2021. Um, the report sets out some fundamentals, including a ministerially approved definition, and more importantly, the 10 principles that sit and very much underpin the report. And it's those principles that are being worked through currently that will define and be presented as secondary legislation of which we can look forward to a consultation on over the summer period this year. We also saw the publication of a golden thread fact sheet, um, which has been very recently updated. And I would encourage everyone to use your uh, uh, favorite search engine of choice to Google uh, golden thread fact sheet and go to the gov.uk website um, to refresh your memories on that fact sheet, having gone through some, um, some minor nuances um, by way of change. The reason I mentioned both those um, materials is because I would encourage everybody to consider both the Brat Golden Thread Report and the Golden Thread Fact Sheet to be the point of authority on this topic. It is, well, they are both products of industry development and the contributions from a breadth and depth of industry experts cross-cutting across a number of disciplines, right through from fire and structural safety, all the way to information management and indeed developer and asset management functions too. Such is the cross-cutting aspect that this policy has. What I'm pleased to see in particular is that industry has taken the lead in a, not only developing the policy and contributing to developing that policy with our official colleagues uh, within DLUC, but also implementing that change ahead of legislation 
within their own organizations. And I just want to set out a couple of examples of that. The first of which that I'll bring to members' attention is the LNQ Golden Thread initiative, for which we'll see some of the outputs of that particular project um, later on this year. The Golden Thread initiative, um, sponsored by DLUC, by the way, um, is seeking to standardize the implementation of the Golden Thread, um, taking into account the number of functions that will contribute to its implementation. Um, a significant piece of work that has been very closely managed from a program level um, that has been supported by the BRAC Golden Thread Working Group and indeed main BRAC as well. Um, and I look forward to some of those outputs being made public in due course. Um, we'll hear a little bit more from um, the chair of BIM for Housing Associations after um, my contribution, but they should absolutely, the team behind BIM for Housing Associations should be held up um, as industry leaders in this space. The work they've done to enable housing associations to develop toolkits, but also use those toolkits within their own organisations is absolutely commendable. And we are very fortunate to have Jack on the, um, on the Golden Thread Working Group so that we can ensure that that cascading of information is a two-way activity. Um, and the last piece I will mention is that um, the, the work that is being done to develop um, national standards and indeed international standards in this space um, should not go unnoted either. A whole host of data standard development has taken place to help enable the process that we've been describing. And I personally have the privilege of chairing um, a BSI committee developing BS8644 part one, which is attempting to bring together the very tricky areas of fire safety and information management and 8644 part one um, will be published later on this year and the team behind that that has been um, furiously working away to publication um, I, I want to thank them publicly for all their efforts before i wrap up though um just um, one, one point on the principles that I mentioned earlier on, and something that I think I hope will be of value to members listening today. Um, the delivery of the golden thread, I think, is pretty much at the stage we're at now. We have a definition, we have those principles, and we are developing our thinking uh, within our own context of our organisations, of course, of what this will mean for ourselves. Um, and ex inextricably, I think it is fair to exercise a little bit of a warning that in the conversations that we've been having about the costs that this will um, uh, inevitably uh, realize, both for our residents, but also for our organizations as well, um, there will be no one digital solution that can deliver upon the total requirements of the golden thread. Um, I like to think of it more as an ecosystem with separate functions delivering separate needs that will ultimately be able to demonstrate to the regulator in the future that your fire and structural safety information is being managed in accordance with what the new requirements will be. Um, and that may be a, an overly complicated way of saying that everyone's golden thread will be unique to them so long as it meets the requirements as set out in future legislation, which we um, can learn a little bit more about, obviously, over the summer period in the consultation, but also in the BRAC golden thread reports as well. So um, I would encourage, the last comment I would make is just to encourage everyone to watch very closely for the publication of that consultation um, and importantly, uh, respond to it, because the more response that we get and the more response that we see to analyse, the better the final product, of course, the secondary legislation will be. So Martin, that brings me to an end and I um, wish every luck to our other presenters and look forward to uh, a Q&A session towards the end. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much. And uh, so, yeah, a, a, a reminder about how to, how to uh, what to look out for and, and how to get involved, but also a really, really powerful uh, a reminder about why it's so important. So th thank you so so much for that. Thanks, Anne. And um, uh, just a reminder to everybody who is listening in, um, do use that Q&A box to make sure that we answer the questions that are most relevant to you that help you um, in your thinking and, and uh, take back to your own organisation. So um, yeah, get those, those questions coming in. Thank you very much, Roman. And Jack, welcome. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And, and uh, that also that my gratitude to to Aman for that nice uh, segue into um, the, the topic. And hopefully you can see my uh, basically well, not exactly plagiarism because we're supposed to be looking at this. Uh, it's the golden thread principles that have been uh, summarized. These are the outputs of the building regulations advisory committee. Uh, you can see there that 
it, it's part of the overarching challenges around culture change. Uh, we've got to deliver. We must deliver this, not just because it's going to become a compliance-driven uh, fact, but in, in my opinion, the, the risks that are being addressed by the legislation, uh, the risks are already here. And what we want to be able to do is deliver really good information, extracting it from the development process and providing it and then replenishing it throughout the life cycle of that asset. And we really want, of all of these 10 principles, I think that the most challenging, important, and, and, and the kernel is that single source of truth. And if we just pause and think a second about, and, and also referencing what Emmett had pointed out, that there's always going to be an ecosystem of information containers, information container being software, spreadsheet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of the things that we use as social housing providers to keep information, how can that be a single source of truth? That is the challenge to be overcome to deliver the golden thread uh, amongst everyone. But I think this is the core of it all. So uh, this is, I think, a really good reminder of how this problem existed way before that tragedy that Ammon pointed out that uh, we shouldn't forget all of those people that have, you know, that are no longer with us and that have been the catalyst to drive this immense change. This is the biggest change to the regulations, to the building regulations since I think 20, 30 years. Um, regardless, take a look at this. I think every social housing provider has opened up a set of plans and uh, this is a real life example of something that I experienced where there's a problem with the heat interface unit. It hadn't been repaired for a long time and the local counselor had been uh, notified and then the CEO cascaded a, a flurry of emails and then I was charged with, uh, okay, find out what the problem is and resolve it. And so I'm being a, a surveyor and a technical manager. The first, my first protocol is look at the plans. This is no block number, no flat number, no cross-reference to these schematics. So here we have a bunch of, uh, you know, first looking at it as a bunch of gobbledygook. Um, where's the fourth floor? I kind of figured that out. Where's flat 42? Can't figure that out from the schematic. And Dame Hackett said at a conference in February 2018, you can see the quote there, asking asset managers to maintain a building without good asset information, without the golden threat, it's tying a hand behind their back. I might disagree with that only the point that it might be two hands because you're driving blind, maybe with an eye patch. Um, so what did I have to do to find out where that HIU was on that schematic? I had to go out on site and I had to cross-reference for the physical inspection uh, just to find out how that particular HIU fit into the rest of the system. Um, this is an example of typical information and what are we going to do about it? What is Southern Housing doing about it? What does BIM for Housing Associations recommend that you, you, you can do to start to build up that golden thread so you don't have to go through this very painful process? You know, the, the key really is the metadata. This is going to be a very core filament to the golden thread. And that is where you want to be able to associate all of these things that are listed on this slide with the flat number or the unique property reference number, not the one that the government has, but I think just about every housing association has a unique property reference number system that's particular to themselves. Uh, everywhere I've worked over the years certainly has them. And that metadata to associate the components that are relevant to safety with the spatial aspect of the building, that is going to be in my, uh, I forecast, that's gonna be where the health and safety executive is going to interrogate your golden threat. And you find stuff in your buildings and your data systems and then be able to tell them that it's been maintained or installed properly in the first place. Um, this is how we're approaching this problem. And it is a spatial hierarchy system, uh, your unique property referencing number. But the difference with it is, is that it's just not unique to our organization. And we strongly recommend that you align your referencing number system with the spaces in the building following these COBE and the Housing Association Charitable Trust Spatial Hierarchy. This is not the place to go with, into this in detail, but this is a signpost here. And then you can see that 
there is a funneling effect of the property referencing number and the spatial aspects of the building. You've got a core there in the numbers. Um, don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to quickly move on because we don't have a lot of time. Here's an example, an output of that process that we're pulling here at Southern Housing Group. Uh, a lot of the other members of Denver Housing Associations are doing a very similar way. They've adapted it slightly differently because they have their own management systems, but they've aligned it with the external standards. UK Housing uh, Housing Associated Charitable Trusts and the UK BIM framework, a little bit more on that. Here we have an interpretation of the UK BIM framework that's been adapted for social housing use. Whole bunch of detail on that slide. Uh, the big high, the big takeaways are that there's organizational information requirements. They inform your asset information requirements, and that informs your asset information model. That is very much what the golden thread. The three boxes underneath it, what populates that. Um, go to to the UK. Sorry, go to the BIM for Housing Association toolkit. There's a lot of explanatory documents to explain what this is. Um, that's a high level principle overview of what that is um, useful for. There's an implementation plan for you to look at uh, that's aligned to the gateways, that's aligned to the development process, that's aligned to the asset management processes. And here on the CDE slide, uh, which is slide 12, just in case I've jumped ahead too far is how we're deploying this for our development program. Uh, we have a very common SharePoint. Uh, we have, instead of allowing our development supply chain to own the information, we are now instructing all of our designers, uh, architects, uh, engineers, uh, to develop designs up until going to tender for contract in a common data environment that we as the client control, that has been so revolutionarily powerful for us to keep track of every little detail, conversation, changes to the plans, the evolution of the plans, who's responsible, who's accountable for making decisions up until contract. Of course, when you tender something out in the design and build way, uh, the main contractors want to keep control of their own information for commercial reasons and for practical purposes. We don't really want to be nosing around what the contractor is doing in their environment. But what we are requiring at Southern Housing Group is that our contractors publish into that common data environment that we still control. And we will be checking thoroughly what has been built at the end of that process in order to inform our building safety case. Um, again, a long, technical, complicated looking slide. Uh, not really able for us to go into that in detail, but you know, there's a signpost there. Um, I think you know, there's a little picture. This is what our BIM is doing. Um, there's a couple of pictures uh, or excerpts from our common data environment. But what I also wanted to show people is how much this costs. And we've spent on nine projects less than a half a million pounds on BIM. And those are some really big contracts that we're running really the percentage to take away is less than one percent so for anybody to come and say there's a huge amount of cost to de deliver bim um one of the reasons why this is so much less than what we had expected i think when we started on our bim journey is that our instructions to the supply chain are clear and concise Bef one particular project was where the architect that the main contractor had given us didn't really understand or interrogate the documents in their contract. And they came to us and said, we're going to model every a wall tie on the external wall. And it's going to cost that alone is going to cost you 200,000 pounds. And we said, that's not necessary. We told them what was important. That it comes back to that relevant and proportional principle of the uh, golden thread principles. Um, the next slide is what we're working on now with BIM for Housing Associations and in Southern Housing Group is the asset information model, which is where we're going to put all of this information that we're developing from our supply chain, that we're developing from the building safety cases that we have on our high-rise buildings. And there's seven uh, relevant areas of that information model where we can associate the documents, 
the repairs, the components, and the systems, and the works orders pertaining to those when it's in the asset management phase with the spatial location, and of course the relevant parties, so we know who's done the work. That, in uh, I think, quite neatly encapsulates what are the, uh, all the key elements of the golden thread that are relevant for us. Um, that's an open source data model that everybody can access now. And if you'd like some more details, you can contact us on, on where you can in, uh, access that, take a look at it um, and, and use it. So housing associations are already employing that uh, to instruct their supply chains, their software supply chains to, instead of doing software that suits the software provider, it's software that delivers the golden thread. But you know, as MN said, there is no silver bullet out there. We're still working, I think, as a complete sector on how we're going to deliver this. So um, this all goes back to delivering that single source of truth. That's uh, the penultimate slide. Uh, hopefully I haven't gotten ahead of the slides too far. And golden thread principles again. And thank you very much uh, for any of those details in the slides. There's some links there for you. And I will happily hand this over to uh, the next presenter. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Jack. Uh, yeah, re re really fascinating presentation and lots of questions, um, I, I, I think, um, uh, uh, emerging as a result. So, certainly some coming in now. Um, and I just a reminder to, to everybody tuning in, do use this as your opportunity to, 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 to ask questions that are going to be useful to you. So um, do use that Q&A box as we go along. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, Vicky, welcome. Uh, and I will hand over to you. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Vicky Saunders. I'm Managing Director of BTP and we have been working alongside a lot of our clients trying to actually deliver the information and make sure that we're getting it right and how that information is recorded and making sure that what goes on in site is sound practice. So I've obviously 25 years experience in all sorts of retrofit. We've uh, accredited with the BIM and the ISO. Anyway, enough about me, I'm sure you can read. Uh, moving on to Boland House, I was just going to use a couple of case studies just to describe sort of where we're actually at in actually trying to make sure that the information, I liked the word the truth, and for me, the truth is actually what is being done at site level and making sure that the paperwork process matches up and marries with the uh, nuts and bolts on site. On Boland House, uh, we set this up as a pilot with great places and we used the metadata behind the model. We used Revit and we exported it out, working closely with Clark and Works to record all the components and try and make sure that we understood where everything is and what state it was in with the idea that we could use this and move forward making sure that the client, Great Places, has accurate information once completed. We have also subsequently moved on to do the EWI, and this is the, uh, the, the building now as it's sort of the scaffolding has been dropped and it's been finished, and a great deal of care and attention has been um, paid to making sure that we have recorded, you know, the fire door installation, this is a checklist, and we are making sure that actually what are we doing on site and what we're seeing is actually logged and recorded and able to be extracted via, we've reverted to Excel, uh, Kobe drops, you know, taking out the information via Excel for the client to integrate it into whatever system they have. And it is a, it's a very valid point to say that there are an ecosystem of information uh, because we've not yet, not yet got one point of, of all the information being gathered together. And we're practically working through these uh, tower blocks and recladding fire and the rest of it. Another project I was going to just use as a case study was the lighthouse because this was a fire that shortly uh, took place after Grandfather and one that we've been involved in and recladding. And the what is absolutely astonishing is the and these are pictures of before. Hopefully not. You can see that this is what we're actually dealing with. And what is most alarming is the construction. 
taking back and it's not just fire that we've ended up looking at we've ended up looking at a whole host the sfs the uh the cement particle board and i think you can see in the top flat there we've actually got back nearly to the internals of the internal of the flat the uh the one which uh actually shows sort of panels missing off on the silver panel between the, the the floors on the left hand side the little red squiggly line believe it or not that is the fire barrier which is not even in the right place and it's not even for the right um it, it, it was not even for that type of construction it was for masonry construction so it was shocking and one of the things i would say is we go through the process of evaluation opening up and trying to understand but till you've actually peeled back the layers of the building you have you know there's a lot of unforeseen elements so we have been busily working away carefully recording and making sure that all that we're doing in terms of the replacement and the strategy is well documented and well recorded so that the client and the residents who you know who own these properties can actually be sure that we have got a building and it's you know it's not just the fire is also involved an awful lot of good practice in terms of materiality understanding fixings repairing sfs so it's been a huge undertaking which is almost like pandora's box one of the for 10 years we've also worked with the moj and they have a system of their kobe drops they have uh, their own sort of bronze silver and gold of the level of information that they require per project so this is kind of quite a useful precedent uh that we're working with and how they want their information uh dropped you know sent to them via excel and really i think the sort of the key messages are for me is that being involved in delivery you know what we've the pit one of the biggest pitfalls i can see is that the paperwork must is is is, a, is good all the checklists and everything but the truth is the real truth is is what actually are we building and having opened up i mean we're working on over um gosh over 20 odd projects what we must be sure of is that we've actually logged and got a good photographic log and we have absolutely understood exactly what it is we're putting back to make sure that uh the um the the rectification is accurate and i do have some concerns about the industry and some of the people who are now jumping on the bandwagon of all this uh sort of reclass i still think we've got a long way to go in terms of ensuring and making sure that delivery matches up to the mark so are there any questions uh, regarding mine and i'll hand you back to martin thank you very much um, some some really um, shocking pictures in there, but uh, uh, yeah, absolutely an example of where where things are at. Um, yeah, Pandora's box is, is is definitely a really good um, description, I think. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are uh, lots of questions coming in, um, so please do keep them um, coming in. Just point you in the direction of the that, that uh, question box, and we will get to uh, like I say as many as possible uh, as soon as we finish the presentations. Thank you, Vicky, um, Robert. Welcome, and uh, I will hand over to you now. Perfect. Thank you very much. And obviously, thank you very much for everyone obviously joining us today and, and for the previous presenters as well. So we're something slightly different. So I'm actually working for Plan Radar. What we are is a digital solution that's used on the construction sites from the actual contractors and developers to capture the information based off of the golden thread in a really easy to use format that anyone can pick up and adopt within a matter of minutes. Now, the platform that we offer and deliver is completely customizable and bespoke through from the delivery and the design processes all the way through to handover and for facility management as well um, and the asset management towards the end. We work with clients like Arup, IFC. Um, so obviously with that, it's the main contractors, you know, doing the work, the developers actually going through the construction phases all the way through to in the individuals on these sites as well, doing the fire stopping, um, the EWS1 inspections, 
and the compartmentation reports and so on and so forth. So again, we're working with all elements in regards to this build cycle through to the handover. Um, so everyone has this open source for collaboration and communication. The platform itself as well, I know that people have also mentioned that you need to be part of an ecosystem. So everything that you're sort of capturing within our platform can be exported out either via a CSV file, so your Excel, um, a PDF report, or actually integrates with any other platforms that you've already got or the main contractor is using as well there. Now, I'm sure by now you probably know exactly what the golden thread, but it's all about keeping hold of accurate and up-to-date information at any sort of time and making sure the right parties are accountable for the work that they're carrying out. Now, we go down into the granular piece of information of which specific individuals of which contractors were on your sites capturing information and at what time. Uh, within our platform, we offer a completely tamper-proof audit trail of every single occurrence happening within a project. Obviously, what is making up the golden thread? Uh, obviously, this is the, the new building size, obviously the heights, the structure, um, the fabrics and the materials being used. There's obviously Vicky has just highlighted a few moments ago as well, uh, making sure that the right material is being used on your sites, on your projects. And again, just having this up-to-date record and back and forth communication. So obviously we've mentioned that we're going to be used for the actual construction phases, but with this as well, we can also be used for actually for asset management and those regular routine inspections on things like fire extinguishers as an example. Now, a few of our clients are using the NFC technology. Uh, so that is a tag put onto things like the fire extinguishers or fire doors. So you can create a completely tamper-proof audit trail based off of that individual item, either with a pinpoint on the plan or an actual NFC tag directly on that. Now, if you were to come in and scan this or you were going to go down doing your own inspection or someone else came there in the future, they would be able to hold up their smartphone or their devices and read the full audit trail as well that's based around that. which is exactly what the next slide sort of said. So it sort of links into that. It's creating places for people and keeping that up-to-date record of the building data from start to finish. Um, we also use this platform for monitoring all um, task assignment, uh, the snagging, the QA processes from start to finish and all health and safety documents, um, the fire risk assessment and so on and so forth. Here we are. This is just a bit of an overview of what we sort of do there again for the fire doors, um, the passive fire protection, accurate links rec rec um, records of specification, uh, the fire test evidence, uh, certification is all tracked and monitored in one platform. Oops, sorry, let's skip through there. And here's a quick overview of the actual platform, just sort of working. We've got the, pin the 2D plans if you're working in 2D. Alternatively, if you are working on a model, you upload your models directly through to plan radar, um, then put an accurate pin location on the plan, uh, select the type of form that you need to capture the information. And again, this would be uh, either free text or drop down boxes that you can obviously pre-select from. So with that, it's 24-7 uh, real-time data, uh, both works in an online and offline mode as well. So if there's no signal, the platform works perfectly. Again, when you automatically go back into somewhere with a Wi-Fi or hotspot, it synchronizes and sends the messages to the right people at the right time. Now, I've mentioned that the platform has already been used for your fire risk assessments, um, the EWS-1 forms as well. So that's both a site observation level, the QA process of um, each of these, or the stages of the, um, the install as well is all being captured here. We've got fire stopping, penetration sealing, uh, you name it, it's in the system. So at Plan Radar, what we believe is, um, is a good acronym, uh, obviously for this process, is TASK, um, is an accurate for the fundamentals of the health and safety of a build, which of course is relevant for the fire safety, as much as the safety of those maintaining the building and those living in the building. 
and here's just a breakdown of what it is. The transparent tamper-proof audit trails for accuracy of the data collection, including the photographs and video stored in one place. We've gone through the fact that we need to capture this in a simple digital method, and obviously the knowledge and power of capturing this information is key. Again, here's just a couple of screenshots of the platform sort of in use, just to go through the simplicity. If you're walking around on site, you put your finger on the screen, add a location or a pinpoint of the, of the information, highlight it, annotate it in any way, and then you can send this through to the subcontractors or the person responsible to carry out the work. Into the setup of the platform, um, Within this system itself, you can actually make it so that only in certain individuals or the clerk of works, as an example, can actually sign off and approve certain elements within the bill phasing um, or so on and so forth as well. As you can see um, from that screenshot halfway down, approved by the clerk of works. So only he can sign it. He or she can sign this off. The system itself, if you're look, using this throughout the construction phases, um, has a 900% return on investment. Approximately seven hours per week are saved using the system. And how we sort of see Plan Radar is it's a black box of everything occurring on site. As you can imagine, if you were to come onto this building in 10 years time and look up certain bits of information, you can instantly and immediately access this data. So. It's the, what we see as the black box for the built environment. And thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you, Robert. And we've got a, a, a whole load of questions coming in. Um, just a reminder to, to everybody to, to get them in. We, we, we will, we will um, come to them very shortly. Um, but before that, uh, we have got one more presentation. And Richard, uh, welcome. And uh, the floor is your, yours. It's over to you. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm the Director of Development for Citizen. Uh, I'm responsible for operation and delivery of our new rule programme, 758 units this year. I won't talk about Hackett Building Safety Bill or regulatory reform, that's done. But what I will say is, you know, necessity dictates it, good practice dictates it, and customers deserve it. And the real important thing for me is timing. Uh, I'm retiring in four years. I'm sure it won't be done by then, but I'd like it to be in place before a lot of you guys retire. I've been on this journey for eight years and we've learned quite a lot. But what we have got, <clears throat> we're introducing building information modelling, only it's not building information modelling. We have a working model, only it's not that either. What we have done is we have got building information management that's all contained within the BIM model, which will become clear. And it was interesting in the fact that we had a lot of experts advising us and things like that, and we recognised very simply, very quickly, that we didn't have the skill set to adopt it, manage it, and update it. So we've gone for what we call a BIM light model, uh, which is working, and I've got it on 16 sites. So we've got a BIM execution plan uh, that aligns with REBA stages. We've got a contract specification to including tenders, and we've got a pre-start programme. And if anybody would like a free copy of any of those, please let us know and we'll issue them accordingly. We can also issue our model by share file if people are interested. Uh, I'm not saying it's the best thing in the world, but it's actually on site and it's actually working. So <clears throat> uh, what we've got, the pictures to the left of this slide, uh, one is a CGI and one is the BIM model, which is on the estate. The top left one is the BIM model. Now, we had councillors and residents objecting to that 54-unit scheme because of a tree. And so we designed away from the tree to protect it for the community. And then we took the BIM model and we walked the residents through it and the councillors so they could actually see it in three-dimensional format. And it proved it was fantastic for consultation because it removed the objections and showed exactly what we were doing. The centre one is just a BIM model, as you can see, that people just spin round and do the BIM thing. On the right, this is the important bit for us. This is the simple approach that we took. It is a filing structure. We all know our filing structures work. It's standardised across 16 schemes that we've got, and it allows people to use it because they already know how to use filing structures. 
and we drop all sorts of information there from planning drawings to electrical search and most importantly for us we have a digital version of the cdm health and safety file that drops in there so this becomes a single source of sort of digital data for people <clears throat> and this is proving to work quite well uh, as a simple format the model itself has won two awards uh, it's won a national award and a regional award uh, through constructing excellence so it has got some merit uh, uh, and that's given us you know, confidence as we go forward. And if I want to reinforce it, uh, then here's uh, the analog file. <clears throat> and two pictures of the same tower block. Left-hand side was a fire two years ago, contained within one flat. Uh, uh, and, you know, pretty straightforward. The one on the right happened last weekend. It was a fire on the 15th floor, a really severe fire. Building performed exactly as it should. We had to temporarily rehouse 257 residents and support that process. Uh, we had to respond to the repairs. There was 9,000 litres of water pumped into the building. We lost all the electrics. It was all pitch black. <clears throat> and, of course, you need information. Like many organisations, we have different directories and we have drives that we keep information on. So H drive, for example, uh, our repairs H drive and asset management H drive, I can't access being the person on call. So I, I can't get to the information very easily to support the teams on site. So it then relied on ringing around people and other people sending that information, couldn't get the electrical search that we requested for, things like that very easily. The model that we've got as it matures and gets embedded more within the business, I'll know exactly where to go. I'll go straight to that. So that, uh, that model goes straight into the filing structure and will have everything from inception to its current operating practices. So <clears throat> uh, a really valuable lesson that I would want other people to uh, experience uh, practically, but I can really assure you now the BIM journey that we've been on and the digitization of information would have contributed to making that an easier process in terms of managing that, what was a major incident. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Very much. Uh, th th thank you for some, some really uh, fa fascinating presentations and uh, yeah, f full of information. And I know we've got some questions coming through directly responding to some of those presentations. Um, so just a, a final reminder, and we'll move into the question and answer session now um, to send through the questions that are going to be useful to you. So again, this is your opportunity, hopefully, to, 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 to get some takeaways that you can apply directly to your own organization. So do keep them coming in. And we've got about 12 minutes left to get through some of those questions. Um, so we're quite, quite tight. Um, so I'll, I'll move straight to some of the, the audience questions. And I'll, I'll throw in some of mine as we, as we move along. Um, I think let, let, let's uh, let's pick up on one perhaps just in terms of um, uh, 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 Vicky's uh, presentation um, uh, and there's a question from uh, David. Uh, hi, David. Uh, given that so much has been built using design and build and given the often poor change management recording, does the client need to commission real as built surveys on completion? rather than relying on the last issue design records. Um, so, uh, Vicky, I think that was a, a response to your presentation, so I'll move to you first, and then the man, I'll probably come to you next. Okay, thank you. I think the real as built, I think what, what we face is we make some assumptions when we strip off, we do as much open up as we can, and what I've having worked on over 20 of these sort of blocks now, every time we fully strip, we find horror stories and there isn't one block of flats uh, that I haven't actually winced at. I mean, and it's, it's shocking to see what we're actually finding. So what we're doing is we're carefully recording the, and we do our information in, in sort of three parts. We do it as the existing, which is, you know, what it was. And then we show what we've stripped off and we show what we've put back. 
And by the time we've opened up and finished off, we record, we have a material tracker so that we track all the materials. We have our fire engineer, we have the building control officer, and we have everybody, this team meeting and this team collective that vets and looks at everything. So what we're doing now in terms of this D&B legacy is that when we're involved on sites, one of the pitfalls I'm really, really concerned about is that people are still seeing this as an opportunity to not, it's just a job to do. This is more than just a job to do, to make money on it. This is actually, a, a, you know, to make sure that as, as the as built information is absolutely accurate. So you need, so what, whenever we hand over a project, the points about knowing where things are, you know, where the details are, and absolutely accurately recording that information. And whether that's downloaded to Excel and however that's stored, you know, there's some nice platforms there to use. The truth of this is, is making sure that you get your asbults that are accurate. And, you know, uh, that first initial undertaking and you do a proper survey before you even start it. So do you need to go and do uh, open up if you've got a good team who are working with you who know what you're doing you're going to get the right results th th thanks very much um and uh, amen i'm going to throw that to, to, to you i mean i think that that's uh uh, situation that Vicky's just describing there, kind of everything that's been opened up, there's been there's been something, and I think you know certainly that's kind of borne out by, I mean, you know, uh, various uh, associations that have published um, uh, their, their own um, findings over over the last few years. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that 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 question to to, to go back to that question, um, I, I guess uh, yeah, do, do you need to commission real as built surveys on completion rather than relying on the the the, the last issue design records? Um, so yeah, Amen, over to you. It's a it's a fair good, it's a fair question, but it's also a very good one as well. And I've been reflecting on it actually since it got popped up into into the chat quite early on um, during Vicky's presentation. Um, I think my answer is if if the processes that we have just been describing have been undertaken in the way that we have just been describing, there may not be a need for a separately commissioned activity to confirm that what was designed was built. The principle behind not just the policy, but the, the, the physical application of the golden thread is effective information management. There are multiple parties that will contribute to the development of fire and structural safety information for higher risk buildings. And if the behaviors amongst those participants are driven effectively by the client stroke accountable person, then in theory, it could be done right the first time around. And you should have to, you know, um, you know, do your appropriate governance and checks and balances to make sure that that is happening. And some of the processes that Jack was describing and, and, and others will um, be able to dive deeper into when they download the, the BIM for HA toolkit, will see that it's quite meticulous to ensure that that process can, can take place effectively. Um, so that's not that that's not to me saying that there wouldn't be value in building an, an additional layer of safety if uh, if a particular project felt like it needed to take that particular approach as is being suggested but when we recognize the nuances between um discharging this new duty in new builds new developments that are captured by that particular trigger height and existing buildings um we, we, we reflect and we recognize that there will be different processes for both. But in that former example, so our new build developments, if information management and exchange of that information is taking place, as I say, effectively and efficiently in line with the principles that we've been describing and are detailed within the Brack Golden Thread report, then I can't see the need necessarily for an, an additional survey on a building that in theory should have been built as per the design. That, thanks, thanks very much. And I, I'll just kind of come back to, oh, I'll move on to a, a slightly different question. And Jack, I'll bring you in in a second. But Amanda, I might just bring you back on, on this because you were talking earlier about the, um, the seeking to standardise the implementation of the golden thread. And I, and I, and I guess I, I wonder just um, uh, the what that means for people who are wrestling with it now, because obviously we're talking about mm. um, uh, perhaps people on, the, on this call being um, uh, particularly engaged, but should you be 
should you be waiting? Is that a sensible thing to be, to be on your mm -hmm. on the front mm -hmm. foot, or should you be waiting to so it's clear what that standardisation is? Um, yeah. And and I guess I'll, I'll just throw you in a question from Dean as well, which we'll move on to with Jack. Um, is the goal to implement the approach Jack just presented to uh, apply to new builds or legacy buildings, and would you go beyond the minimum requirements set out in the regulations or beyond? Um, as likely helpful to our asset management. So I guess it's a kind of where do you stop as well? But um, yeah, I yeah. think they're kind of linked. I think I think they are, and I'll let I'll, I'll let Jack pick up the, um, the 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 latter part of the question if that's okay, Martin, because he'll 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 do a much better job sure. answering it than I will. Um, but on on the first part, um, c can I preface my answer with I understand and I am sympathetic to those organisations that feel like they've had their um, fingers burnt from the um, the core message of get on with this now before the legislation is in place and then the subsequent amendments that went through the house of lords much of which was wholly unexpected um and now was having some ramifications throughout um the application of those requirements can i just remind people that royal assent um has been assigned to the building safety bill and the golden thread is a requirement under the primary legislation the bill itself so as it becomes an act this duty is coming it absolutely is coming and in fact we can stop say it's coming now it's here it's done um the building safety bill will be an act in a few short hours um so to that point absolutely start thinking if you haven't begun your thinking on this and i think i mean your poll demonstrated martin didn't it that represents a a, a small minority of the industry because i have seen some significant proactivity amongst has and social landlords in this space um both in a personal capacity and in my official capacity as well um in terms of the standardization piece, I think what would be helpful before I pass on to Jack is um, an understanding of how the regulator intends to actually regulate this duty. Um, and building safety regulator inspecting officers that will come out and actually check for compliance against the golden thread, I can assure you won't be looking for prescriptive measures of compliance. If you can demonstrate that you are discharging the duty in a functional way, much like we do with building regulations, of course, that will differ if you're a uh, a member of, for example, citizen housing or um, southern housing or Ellen Hugh, et cetera, et cetera, and your approach to discharging that duty is unique but equally effective, therefore demonstrates compliance to that future requirement. That is what those regulators are looking for. They won't be looking for checkbox and tick box lists to ensure that you've done point A to point B to point C. We're moving away from that, and that is the very principle behind how we will um, address risk management across the built environment for the future and you're seeing that through the development of safety case principles that are that are more um, embedded within other sectors and other industries like nuclear um so i hope that's helpful i hope that's clear and i'm happy to take um some uh, some responses back on that if needs be Really clear. Th th thanks very much, Roman. And 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 uh, yeah, Jack, I'll move to you with that question about going beyond. Um, and uh, there's also a question from Lola. Um, the Building Safety Bill Impact Assessment Report refers to BIM one. Is it essential that landlords use BIM for the Golden Thread? Um, so so Jack, um, uh, over, over to you. And if you, if we can keep it relatively brief, because we're, we're we're running yeah. out of time now, I think. So. Yeah, yeah. I I I think the answer. You know, even why enthusiasm for BIM is it going to be law is the law going to say you must do BIM the answer is going to be no because the law is already there it doesn't say do that but uh, what Ammon was uh, outlining is that there's going to be a, a variety of ways to discharge your duties the most efficient way I think is BIM BIM is part of the building regulations advisory committee discussion and doing that deploying BIM is not going to be wrong it's going to be one of, and probably the best way, the most efficient way, and it's going to provide a whole bunch of ancillary benefits. I think, you know, what uh, to take the example of uh, as-built drawings. Uh, you know, sometimes I joke around that you know you get it handed over at, your, uh, at the end of a project, they're as last drawn, and they often don't reflect what's in the building. It's the drawings are usually not the real problem; it's actually the products or the specifications. But sometimes there is deviation there what the golden thread initiative is uh, I, I think as a theme if i'm not mistaken there's a thing called the visual record um that's something that you can build up over time throughout the project so you will have there's all sorts of different technologies emerging for solutions for that plan radar is one of them that we, we saw that's quite interesting and there's uh, there's cameras that go on the clerk of works heads and as they walk around and there's a 3d visualization every time they do an inspection that gets layered up uh, one of the things I also just like to throw in there is about a remedy towards that building information at handover is that you can amend your contract. You could say to your contractor, 
if you don't give me the pictures, if you don't give me the information, and I have to open up, I have the right to open up now at your cost just to verify. And if it's right, you still have to pay. That's in our contracts now. That's a common uh, amendment. So that is going to compel the supply chain outside of BIM to give you the information that you require to say to your building safety case, inspector, it's safe. So, um, but all of those things that I've just mentioned are going above the regulations. Every single one of those is the, the regulations are broad brush. The law is broad brush. We're the experts here. The government has told us in principle what outcomes are required. It's up to us to figure out how to do it. Thank, thanks very much, Jack, and uh, a, a, a really detailed answer, so uh, very much appreciated. We're almost out of time. I'm just going to throw, Robert, one, one question at you, because we'd, we'd obviously heard a man talking earlier about the uh, the digital solution ecosystem uh, and how that's going to work. And there's a question from Daniel that's come in, which is, um, does the, the plan radar system work with other models too? So uh, does it fit into that? How does it fit into that ecosystem? If we can keep it relatively brief, Robert, because we're, we're pretty much out of time. So, Robert, over to you. Yeah, of course, because um, Plan Radar is completely customized and bespoke, you can obviously keep the existing platforms you have in place. What you do with the, our platform is configure and customize the metadata field to the questions that you're asking. And as long as these um, replicate the ones you're using in existing platforms, the information can be integrated and transferred from system to system uh, automatically or obviously exported into Excels or imported via Excels into the platform. So the answer is yes, it will fit in well with your ecosystem. Thank you very much, Robert. And um, I, th I, I am really sorry we are out of out of time. Hopefully we've got through a decent cross section of your questions. Um, so what remains for me to do um, is to thank all of our panelists for some really um, yeah fantastic and fascinating presentations and some some great specific answers to your your questions as well. Um, thank you all. Um, thanks to Plan Radar for enabling this to happen today, um, and thanks to you all for for tuning in. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much, and see you very soon. Thank you.